without further ado, we're um, very happy to welcome back Karen. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alana. It's so nice to be back teaching for my Ann. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to do so. Um, I really enjoy interactive. So if you want to obviously love to, you know, engage, if you have any questions or comments, just feel free to come in um, with them. They always add a lot. So um, sort of like inviting that feedback from you. Um, so I'm going to share my source sheet. Hold on. Okay. So the title of this um, class is All for One and One for All, and the, under, the relationship between the individual and the community. I've actually thought a lot, I've been thinking a lot about this topic um, ever since we were in lockdown. I mean, obviously it's an important topic and I you know, enjoy um, discussing it in classes, um, but in particular, since we went into lockdown with the um, back in the spring, in the early spring, and then being back in class, you know, um, a lot of what people were talking about is the importance of connecting, the importance of, you know, not being, not feeling isolated. Um, and so that idea of the importance of community was very, very front and center. And then now this year in school, we have a very interesting um, and new type of, you know, situation where, we have kids that are in the building. At the same time, we have kids that are gonna be remote all year, regardless of whether we're all remote or not. Um, I mean, there's a lot of this really cool technology. And then, but the challenge is how do we create community um, amongst all the students where there's um, equality, um, you know, and this, every student, regardless of where they are in the, you know, in the building, as it were, our like extended ge non-geographical building to make sure that they're all getting the same experience. Um, but at the same time, really honoring the experience of each individual student. So, you know, trying to balance the importance of the individual um, and meeting individual student needs, for example, within while still maintaining a strong and vibrant community has really, um, brought again this particular topic to the fore. And what I want to explore tonight together is how they actually interlace with each other, where there is never the case in the Jewish sources that um, we're meant to see community as, you know, the most important thing and the individual is squashed nor are we going to say, oh, well, individuality is the, and, and the individual and their individuality is the most important thing, number one, where like, if you're part of a community, great. And if not, that's still awesome. We're actually gonna see how they, um, the individual and the community are enriched by each other. Um, and that in an ideal world, that is where we should, we need to try to find, it's not even a balance that we're looking for, because that seems to imply a lot, you know, separate things that are weighed, you know, the same, as opposed to seeing here what I want to, the, the place that I would like to get to is to see them as braided together. So still separate, but interwoven, and that's where their strengths really come in. Um, and the first thing that I would ask you to think about is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Uh, which I just actually listened to yesterday. Um, and the way that, you know, if we had the time, I'd actually play it as a starter and then we can unpack it. But this year is not about Beethoven or about his Ninth Symphony. Um, but in the most famous part of it, one that really, really is sort of part of the public conscious is you have, there's a beginning where there's, I believe it's a, kind of want to say it's a cello, but I'm not sure. There's a string instrument or maybe two that are playing in the beginning and then more and more instruments are added until you get the full choir that are singing um, in that major crescendo, right? And so it's a beautiful example of, you know, a small beginning that is incredibly beautiful, right? I enjoy listening to sonatas that, becomes, you know, incredibly beautiful and powerful and meaningful the more that you add people. And so I want you to sort of keep that in your mind about that, you know, how it's not just we're heading into the full on, 
one of the things that makes Beethoven's Ninth so just so compelling and so moving and so chills inducing is that progression of the beginning of the one, um, which then becomes the many, whereas in an orchestra, again, if we're going to continue on that metaphor, each instrument, you can't have the symphony without any of the instruments or class of instruments missing. Um, so it's like, you know, you can't just have the symphony with one or two, but you can't have the full symphony missing one. And so that's the interlace sort of use, think about that as a metaphor. Okay. The first source that is sort of the intro source that I'm going to start with and then I'm going to end with is Migdal Bavel. And I know that um, the first shear in the series, I believe, was focused on Migdal Bavel. I actually, I saw the source sheet, but I didn't have a chance to listen to it. So this is not a shear about Migdal Bavel, but... And there are a lot of ways to read this narrative. So we go through it quickly. And then at the end of this year, we're going to, we'll return to it, be um, informed by the sources that we're going to look at. And this particular narrative, in many ways, it can be construed as a celebration of community, or it could be about the origins of language or, you know, God's, you know, sort of really connecting to and making sure that you are following God. Like it's a whole different, as a whole, you know, myriad of ways to interpret this. And that basically the way that I want to see this is again in the introduction is that it's not a narrative that celebrates the community, although it in many ways it does. But once you read the whole thing together by the end, it really becomes a celebration of or a, you know, a path towards the celebration of the individual. Um, so just to quickly read it through, we're not going to unpack it, obviously, because we don't have the time. Um, right, the entire land was one language and one whatever Devarim is, but I would say one mission, one vision. And and they traveled from the east and they settled in the valley of Shinar and they settled there. And each person said to his fellow, let's make bricks and burn them, right? They're very resourceful. So they did. They made bricks out of, and they made mortar out of the non necessarily natural materials, innovators that are resourceful using all the resources they had. And here we have the Ish Alachiv. So we have everybody's coming together and speaking the same language, but already it's one person said to their fellow. But then you'll see a lot of the narrative is in plural rather than singular. Vayomru, right? Hava Nivna Lanu Iru Migdal, Verosho, Vashamai, Vanasel, and Ushem, Penna Fut, Alpne Kol Arat. This is very we oriented now, right? Let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose um, the top of it is in the heavens, and we will make for ourselves a name, lest we be spread out over the entire world. Again, this is very community-centered. We want to make ourselves a name, where like we're the city with like the tallest building in the world, and I believe, I think the tallest building in the world right now is in Dubai. Cannot pronounce the name of it. Um, so that becomes a city that has that great building. Also, they're building a city, so they want to have an amazing metropolis so that they don't want to get spread out, right? We're all shepherds. I don't want to get lost. So if I get lost, I can just say, you know where the city is that has that amazing tower that's full of awesome technology and they can know where to go. God comes down to see this city and this tower that the sons of men, the people, let's say, it's being meticulous in the language, but we're not unpacking this. Um, have built or were building. And God said, here, behold, they are, they are one nation, they speak one language, and this is what they've begun to do with being one nation with one language. And now nothing that they envision will be withheld from them, right? If they're showing that this is what they can do, with having one language, speaking one language and having one vision. And this is amazing, the city and this tower, nothing's gonna hold them back. So again, it's very interesting to try to 
you know, decide what the tone is, uh, um, God's tone in this exclamation. Um, but come let us go down and we're going to scrabble their language so that each person cannot hear the language of his fellow. So it seems that the consequence indicates that whatever the tone was in the observation that God made, it wasn't a positive tone. Um, and God come down, scrabble the language, right? So the problem really here is the fact that they're speaking, something relating to the speaking and communication. God spread them out and scattered them all over the face of the land, and they stopped building the city. Note again, they're not, nothing about the tower here. It's about stopping building the city. There God confused the language, so it's called Bavel, and from there, God scattered them. So again, again, we're not going to, I don't want to go too much in the detail, but to point out that one of the problems, like if we're going to see this not as a action punishment, but as an action consequence um, of a choice, then what really, if we're going to look at what's bothering God, is that is the language, right? By Yomer Hashem, Hein Am Echad V'Safa Achat, one nation, one language. So what am I going to do? I'm going to um, mix up their language so they can't communicate with each other. So it's not necessarily, you know, some Parshanim say the tower and, you know, trying to fight against God, right? That's Rashi, or they're trying to, you know, become pop more popular than anybody else, exceed God in popularity. But here, if we really focus on what the consequence is, this is about communication and it's about language and about what happens when it's only one language when all a huge group of people here it's like humanity it can't be humanity but a huge group of people speak one language and have only one vision it sounds like this is what's problematic according to psukim so a consequence was we got to make sure they can't speak to each other that there isn't only one language that there isn't only one vision and so i'm going to leave that question open but keeping in mind that it was something community or big group aspect that was problematic within the context of sameness, right? The, you know, everything, a big group is all being the same was somehow problematic, even though when you read this initially, it's like, oh, good for them. That's so innovative. That we love unity. We love, you know, creativity. When people can come together, man, how am I going to like make the new iPhone Pro 12? iPhone 12 Pro without all that innovation and the whole team that's making it. But obviously something was wrong here. So we'll come back to that once we've seen the sources. Okay. And so now we're going to launch into the individual. So on page two on the source sheet, starting in the beginning in Sefer Breshit, Zeh Sefer Toldot Adam, Biyom Rua Lokim, Adam Bitmut Lokim Asaoto. These are the generations of mankind. Um, on the day that God created mankind in the likeness of God, demut elokim, right? The word tselem was used in Parak Aleph, which would be the image. Um, here, mankind was created be demut elokim in the image of the likeness of God. He made him. So again, we're being told here that these are the generations of mankind. By the way, the important thing to know about mankind is that they were made in the image of God. Even I could say the truth is that in the singular, Adam was made in the, um, in the image of God. So that's the important part about the individual is what makes each individual unique is that they are modeled on the image of God. What does that mean? That's a different shear. Only that Adam was in the image, image of God. And so the generations of Adam will somehow reflect that. Each individual will reflect that kind of... Um, shared feature, as it were. And then continuing on in terms of the importance of the individual, we have, we're going to zoom ahead to Vayikra Parakitet. That's the Kedoshim Tihiyu, the Be Holy chapter with the instruction manual that follows of how to be holy. Right? Don't take vengeance or don't bear a grudge against your fellow. Um, and again, B'nei um, Amecha is in the plural, so countrymen. And love your fellow as you love yourself. I'm the Lord, your God. So again, it's, you know, we're talking about the value of the individual as you yourself value yourself, 
right? This is not about community. This is about the worth, the value that an individual sees about themselves as having value. Again, this is not a judgment, like you shouldn't be seeing yourself as an individual. It's acknowledging a reality that often we will view ourselves and we will value ourselves. And so therefore we should value others in that way that we want to be valued. Again, it's it sort of simplifies a little bit human nature because sometimes individuals do not necessarily value themselves, but this is running under the assumption that an individual will value themselves more than others. And then God is saying, no, 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 you have to value others in the way that you love yourself. And then later in the parak, just to be clear that it's not just fellow Israelites, the stranger who resides with you is also should be considered equal as one of your countrymen, one of your citizens, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt, I'm the Lord your God. Right? This is about empathy, that there's the importance that the way that you see other people, other individuals, do not, um, you know... You should not be biased in terms of your, you know, very specific circle of community. You need to value singular hager hagar itchem, the individual stranger, as it were, the other that is coming and residing in your community. They are like you. So again, this is very much and because of empathy. You were slaves in Egypt, therefore you need to treat the other as you would want to be. Um, as you yourself would want to be treated again, this is in the singular, lo kamocha. And again, these two sources are really underscoring the value of the individual other. And that each individual, even though we as human beings might be inclined to value ourselves, right, in the sort of concentric circles of giving, we might see that circle of there's me, then there's my family, then there's my friends, then there's my community, and then there's the world. Here, it's, you might see yourself like that, but it shouldn't necessarily be concentric circles. It should be, and I'm not talking about tzedakah, this is about perception, that each individual really deserves that equality. And God uses the, um, the character trait of empathy as a way of pulling on that and ensuring that the, each individual is valued. So again, these are not about community. These are laws that are what feeds our holiness, what feeds our holiness, even as a nation, is to really love the other as much as we love ourselves. And this is not bind yourself to the community. This is acknowledge the importance of the other. Questions or comments so far? Okay. I can't see everybody at the same time. I have the like strip. So just Bear with me because I want to have the source sheet as the main screen so I can't see all of you in gallery view. Um, okay, good. And now we move forward to what Chazal have to say. We're going to see, we're going to come back to a source from the Tanakh in the middle, um, but we're going to move into rabbinic sources. And we have the famous, you know, sort of, I guess I can call it a debate of what's the most fundamental principle, right? In the Talmud Yerushalmi, Vaptorecha Kamocha, Rabbi Akiva Omer, Zehu Klal Gadol Torah. Rabbi Akiva says, this is the greatest fundamental principle of the Torah, Vaptorecha Kamocha. Ben Azai says, Ben Azai Omer, Zeh Sefer Tolo Adam, Zeh Klal Gadol Mizeh. Ben Azai says, actually, that pasuk, Zeh Sefer Tolo Adam, that we saw in the beginning, that transcends the weight of Vaptorecha Kamocha. Why? Because that particular pasuk tells us that each person was created, or man was created in the image of God. So how can you love your neighbor if you don't love your? How can you love your neighbor as yourself if you don't understand the value that each individual has, and even all the more so the value that you have? So again, the reality is there are many people that do not value themselves and they actually value others more than they value themselves. And this is says this is going in both ways. That the principle, Ben Azai says, of everybody's created in the image of God, whether you are inclined to value yourself more than other people, or rather you are inclined 
to not value yourself as much as other people. Their needs, each individual needs to have that equality because each person was created in the image of God. There isn't, there's that distinction that there's a similarity, a shared feature, a spiritual feature within each individual and therefore each deserves that love. Okay, it's a famous debate. So now we're gonna start seeing, we're gonna move a little bit away from the equality piece. Tanya, it was taught, they said about Hillel, the elder, that when he used to rejoice at the Simchat Bidah Shoeva and Sukkot, he would say, if I am here, everyone is here. But if I'm not here, who is here? Right, this sort of, we're going to see the other famous statement from Hillel, but... Here he's saying, again, what I bring to the table is huge, right? If I'm listening to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, if I don't have the cello in the beginning, and I don't have that deep sound, then you don't have the Beethoven's Ninth. It just is not, it doesn't exist, right? If I'm going to a party, he's not saying here, there's going to be, I'm the life of the party, and there's going to be no party if I'm not there. It's as if I'm bringing something very significant to the table, and if I'm not there, that aspect of me, that individuality, that piece will not be there. It'll be, wait, who is there? Who is here at this place? In other words, like, who's there? People, that's fine, but not what I bring to the table. And so again, Hill is acknowledging not just that mankind is created in the image of God and that there's that shared feature, but that every individual has unique features to them, right? They have their own character traits that they bring to a table that other people don't bring to the table. And so if I'm not here, who's here, right? It's not, again, you can really read this as a selfish statement, but I think it's not about, a, or self-centered. It's not about self-centered as much as each individual, like you can't have, a whole when one is missing, when one that uniqueness is just, if I'm not here, who's here? It's gonna, it's incomplete. There's no full, there's no fullness here unless we have what I'm bringing. So that's part of what Hillel, when we come to Hillel's second statement, it'll jive with it a little bit more, but there we have that teaching. And in Pirkei Avot, right? I love Pirkei, I'm just gonna say, I love Pirkei Avot because of all of the interpersonal relationship um, teachings that are within it. Um, so go in your copious amounts of spare time. Learn for a vote. So who are you, Omer? Rabbi Akiva. Chaviva Dam Shani Rabbit Salam. That um, beloved is humankind who was created in the image of God, right? That is what makes humankind so special. Again, going back to that statement in Breshit that humanity is special there because they're created in the image of God. Therefore, we need to, that is why this is not about him saying this is how we community treat each other. This is a statement of the truth about people is that they're beloved, all of them. And Chaviv Adam, this is not Chaviv everybody. This is each individual. Chaviv Adam, Shani Rabbatelam, that they were created in the image of God. Again, it's very oriented around the individual and the value that is being placed on the individual. And then finally, I'm just looking at the time, so I'm just going to read this in English. Um, the, in Masachat and Hedrin, we have, for this reason, man was created alone, to teach that whoever destroys a single soul of Israel, the Torah considered it as if he destroyed a whole world. And whoever preserves a single soul of Israel, the Torah considered as, that, as though he preserved a complete world. Furthermore, he was created alone for the sake of peace among men, that one might not say to his fellow, my father was greater than yours. And so that heretics won't say there are many ruling powers in heaven. Again, to proclaim the greatness of the Holy One, blessed be he, for if man strikes many coins from a mo one mold, they all resemble one another. But the Supreme King of Kings, the Holy One, blessed be he, fashioned every man, and yet not one of them resembles his fellow. Therefore, every single person is obliged to say the world was created for my sake. In other words, again, 
you take one individual out, if you destroy a single soul, right? And this is an interesting language. Um, it's not if you destroy one person, it's if you destroy a single soul. And the soul of a person, it's very interesting the different context in which the Gemara or even the Tanakh, a lot of times when we're looking at um, different texts that are considered songs or poetry and Tehillim in particular, it's really interesting to see, to be mindful of when the language is identifying the individual person, a nefesh or Adam, versus when it talks about, um, when, it's, um, when it's talking about the soul, the neshama. And so here, someone who destroys a single soul of Israel is considered to have destroyed the world. And if we think about our soul in a way that it's the part of us that makes us, us, again, there's a lot of ways to interpret what the soul is. So that's a unique part of ourselves that's outside of us, that's external to the part of us that is, you know, this, I guess, to use words, the supernatural part of us that connects to the divine. If you destroy that, so if you destroy, if you're with your friend and something that you've said or something that you've done somehow compromises their connection to something greater and meet things that are, and, you know, and, and meaning, if you destroy the thing, whatever it is that makes that person a person, who they are, more than just their biology, more than just their psychology, more than just their, you know, physiology, all those ologies, more than that, when you destroy that, that's when you have destroyed a whole world, right? And if you preserve that, right, if you can reinforce or enrich that aspect of a person or those aspects of a person, what makes them unique, then you've saved the whole world, right? Because there are each individual like coming down here, when God makes each individual, unlike when coins are made, a human makes a coin, they all sort of resemble each other because they're all made from one mold. When God makes a person, right, every single person is unique. Not one of them resembles his fellow. And therefore, every person is obliged to say the world was created for my sake. Right? Again, not in a selfish way, because if you, if you become, if you make it a selfish comment, if you make it a selfish reflection that, you know, the world is created for me and no one else, so I'm better. If it becomes that, then you've missed the point of what's being said here. The world was created for my sake. Again, similar to what Hillel was saying, is that the war, something about the world will be missing. There will be a vacuum in a particular part of the world, right? If we think about the world um, as a puzzle, right? And that each individual is what makes up that puzzle, even if it's to the tiniest piece, if you take out that piece, or even if that piece is in there, but you erase the color from that piece, right? It's, it's supposed to be a pink piece in the middle with the little sprinkle because it's the part of the donut that is the edge. If you either take the piece out or you keep the piece in, but you take out the color of it so it still disconnects, then you've destroyed the puzzle. So you're not going to frame this puzzle now. You're not going to say, I'm done. You're going to say, I got to get another one of these puzzles because I got to either find the hole or I have to make the picture proper and perfect um, because that's the way puzzles work. So everyone is to say, the world is created for my sake, and that's every person, each individual. And so all these sources together, when you take them, they really highlight that within Jewish sources, within Judaism, the individual is important and not just important, that the, the very essence of the world is rel relies on each individual and what each individual brings to the table. So that even if, you know, you're to have a whole collection of character traits that existed, like if we're going to say there is, you know, 20 key character traits that exist that different people that you can have different people have different mixtures of them or of the mixtures they have different volumes um volumes of them or amounts of them sort of like um and at various times in their lives the part of them that is you know that has the part of them that is empathy might be stronger than another time of their life right there's never going to be a time where everybody's the same and what is really complicated about this is, again, psychologically, we evolve as people as we get older, and we change as people as we get older. 
And even within the ongoing change, the world changes with us and people change with us. And, you know, you'll have more, you know, as time progresses, times change. And so generations have to change and we have to adapt. And it's just a really, it almost feels um, surprising that even within those changes that no, there's no one that you can take out. And so what's interesting now within society, again, before, like pre-COVID, you know, we live in a society that is, we have iPhones and iPads and I might be with somebody, but I'm texting and the other person is texting and maybe I'm texting the person in front of me or maybe I'm, you know, texting someone else. So I'm in my own space or even I'm walking down the street among many people, but I'm listening to music. I, this is what I do. I'm listening to music. So I'm my, I am by myself in my vacuum among other people. That is the society in which we live. There is, and you know, we live in America that prizes individuality, you know, who we are, that we should embrace, you know, that aspect. And there is value because of, because of that. But, 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 what you have in a source like this is not only about the individual, in this source in particular, let's say, um, and certainly in the other sources about how we need to um, love the other. In this source in particular, in, the, um, in Sanhedrin, what you have here is the importance of the individual within the group, within the world, that yes, the world is um, incomplete without this person. So the world was created for me. At the same time, if you take out the soul of Israel, you've destroyed the world. And so the individual exists within the world. So yes, if you take out a piece of the puzzle, the puzzle is incomplete, but we all live in a puzzle, as it were right? We all live in a tapestry. That's what makes the world so beautiful and magnificent and just um, so rich and vibrant is that it is made up of so many pieces. And if one person is removed from that, if they themselves are removed from, they remove themselves or they are somehow removed from it, that impacts the ideal of community. And again, it's something within, it's, it was really highlighted when we all had to go into lockdown, right? And we were in many ways forced to be, you know, isolated in some way, whether it's I'm completely cut off from everybody and from people at work, um, or like, but I, but I can think, you know, for those that could connect through FaceTime, through WhatsApp chat, like, thank God that we had that. But, you know, one of the main things that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, psychologists were talking about was we're lacking face-to-face -face interactions. We're lacking being able to connect to what's bigger, the bigger, broader community. And we hurt. It was hurting us. It made people, it was hurting them. They were feeling it. Communities were feeling it. And so when you take a person, again, each of us as individuals, we value us as individuals and we can recognize the importance that we bring to the table as individuals. At the same time, there really is no denying that we are part of a group and that we are meant to be part of a group. Um, and so you have this balance, especially in this source, really coming to the fore of, yes, we're all, no one's the same. We're all um, created in the image of God, but it is part of, we are part of a world we are part of something bigger and there's no way around that. Again, interlaced together, not separate. One relies on the other. So again, I'll pause before we pivot. Although we're in, we're in the process of pivoting, but I'll pause before we pivot further. Okay, awesome. So if anybody there, um, I know there's like icons so that even if your screen is off, you could always also press the hand raise icon so that I can still see if you wanna, but I can also hear you. So if you wanna just jump right in, you can just jump right in. I guess I'm very much stuck in the frame of mind of, you know, 
classroom where, you know, use the icon so that I know that you're raising your hand. So sorry about that. <laughs> Just, it's hard to pull out. Um, okay. But I want to pivot now where we focus on the value that um, Judaism places on community, moving away from focusing on the individual. And the pivot point, um, actually, it happens really in source, I would argue, in source 11. But we'll start at source 9 because it also is a pivot comment is who Haya Omer, the who here is Hillel. Remember, Hillel is the one that says, the party hasn't started if I'm not there. There's no party. If it's if I'm there, yes. If I'm not there, mm, nothing's happening. He also says, Im ena nili nili, atzmi ma'ani, im lo achshav imatai. And if, if I'm not for myself, who is for me? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Such a famous teaching that we, there's, there's songs. Whenever you make a song about something, then you know it's important. And if you have multiple melodies for the teaching, then you know it's really important because you've got everybody's doing, making it their own by um, giving it different melodies. But there are really profound separate teachings in here. So if we were going to break this down, if I'm not for myself, who is for me? In a very modern way, this is about, again, I'll use modern language. This is about self-care, right? I, I need to take care of myself, right? Who is going to take care of me if I'm not taking care of me, right? If not for myself, who is for me? I have a responsibility, and this is step one. I have a responsibility to myself to make sure that I am being my best self, that I'm being my healthiest self um, before anything else happens. Because no one, even though I could have people that are going to care for me and whatever that means and whoever that is, and you know, we have networks, if I don't do it, if I don't take that step and there are ways that I can, right? And if I'm not focused on making sure that I can be my best self, well, who's going to do it? And it has to happen. But if I'm only for myself, if I'm only focused on me, then what am I, right? If I only get you know, caught up in the self-care and I'm not thinking about other care, if I'm not having that character trait of empathy, acknowledging there's an other, if it's not the hospital reacha kamocha, right? Then what am I, right? I'm... I'm just that puzzle piece that has no puzzle. I'm just that thread that has no tapestry. So if I'm only for myself and there's only, you know, self-orientation, then I'm not, I'm not a full self, capital S, because I can only be really my best self when there are others. And again, science has proven that in character development, within the concept of character development, real character development happens when you have someone else who's you know, sort of with you in your character development so that if you're working on the character traits, the midot of, um, you know, being able to reflect or, you know, of, I keep coming back to empathy. That's always at the top of my mind. It's so important or kindness or, you know, wisdom, you know, people like you can, there are ways for yourself, for you to grow and for you to constantly focus and constantly practice consciously about building those. But when people are working together, real growth happens quicker and more deeply because other people see what you cannot necessarily see. So if I'm not for myself if, or if for my own self, what am I? I can't be my best self. I can't be my full capital S without other people with me. And if not now, when? All right, so this one seems a little bit unrelated, right? When you look at this, if I'm not for myself, who is for me? If I'm only for myself, then what am I? I get the connection between those two. If not, now when? Well, what's that doing there? That is not, that doesn't seem at first glance to be about people. It seems about other, like my presence in outside, right? If not now, when? It's about time and about actions. Um, at first glance. But again, to be 
modern to like sort of superimpose modern perspective on, you know, where Hillel is BCE, right? sort of an ancient perspective that in very many ways, this is, you know, there's an aspect of mindfulness here that if not now, if I can't be in the present, when will I be able to do X, Y, or Z, right? And yes, in, a, in many ways, this is not mindfulness in that, you know, you're not only focused on the present in this, you're not only focused on the present in the statement because you're orienting also, you're thinking about what's coming next. Is it, like you're not, Hillel's not saying here, don't focus on the when, focus on the now. It's if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? But there is an aspect of if you're not in the moment, if you're not taking advantage of the moment, whether it's taking advantage of the moment to center yourself or taking advantage of the moment to see the opportunity that you have in the next moment, because you're not going to be able to see that opportunity and maximize what comes next if you don't acknowledge you're not present now, if you're not in the now. So yes, I am inserting a word here of if not now, when? If not now, if I can't be in the now, the when doesn't matter or the when remains, you know, in the realm, this very ambiguous realm. It rem remains in the realm of theory. So if not now, I need to be present. So then what does it have to do with what comes before? Well, at the end of the day, for me to be able to acknowledge and care and understand and reflect on who I am, since that's the only thing I can do myself in that moment. But if also I can't take that perspective and be there for someone else at this moment, then when is any of this going to happen, right? If not now that I'm not doing all these things, when is anything going to happen in its fullest? If not now, to be my whole present self in order to, uh, to do whatever I need to be there for other. Again, it's not wholly mindful mindfulness because it's not exclusively focusing on the present. The very Jewish idea here is that's present, not that mindfulness isn't a Jewish idea, that is too, but that's a whole other sheer. Um, this is not, it's really like a lot of the value that we have, values that we have are very or oriented towards self and other. Again, that's the nature of what we just saw. The individual is really important, even within the Jewish sources. At the end of the day, what Hillel is saying, if you're not seeing the two as interlaced, if you don't, in the same teaching, see understanding yourself and who you are, that in a way that only you can do, and at the same time, you're not able or willing or considering the other, then you're not your whole self. But in order to be able to do both of those things, do it now. Like now's the moment to take advantage of quieting yourself in order for you to be able to have the perspective, to see what others have to offer, to see what the world has to offer in order for you to grow and to give. And if you're not going to do it now, you know, when is the next time you're going to do it? I saw this amazing TED Talk. Again, it's one of my favorites. I'm like all about TED Talks. I love them. Um, where there was this Buddhist monk. He was the one who was presenting. And he was connecting um, mindfulness to gratitude. And that the two together bring happiness. And how do the two of them together lead to happiness? Because when you're present in the moment, you can see that every moment has an opportunity. And that if you miss that moment, don't worry, there's always another moment in which you can stop and see the possibility, see the opportunities that you have, whatever that looks like to give, right? That's gratitude where you're expressing whether it's gratitude for having the moment or gratitude for whatever you're experiencing in that moment. Wow, it's beautiful outside. Or wow, I'm blessed that I have electricity. Or wow, I'm blessed that I, you know, whatever is whatever the many things that you can be grateful for there's so many things and so again he sort of sees there's the when cannot come without the akshav and one more hillel statement about community holy hillel omer altifrosh min hasibor hillel says 
like sort of almost a 180 in theory of the pre previous teaching, don't separate. It's not really a 180, but don't separate yourself from the community. Don't come out of it, right? And he already says, he's already taught why it's important. But here he's making it very explicit. Don't say, separate yourself. And when I've always learned this um, teaching, I've always learned it as in the context of don't isolate yourself or the community is what's important. And when you take yourself out of the community, then this is what you lose, right? I'll teach Bosh Minat Sibor, almost an admonishment. That's always how I've learned it. That's always the context in which I've learned it. But I want to show you another pasuk, which again, I think gives a different perspective on the importance of not separating yourself out from the community. And that's this pasuk from Kohelet. Again, a very famous teaching. Two are better than one in that they have a greater benefit in their toil. There's earnings here, but in their toil. If they fall, if one should fall, or should they fall, one can raise the other. So if one falls, one can raise the other, the one who's standing. Or if they both fall, whoever gets up first can raise the other. Or whoever's stronger can push up the other. But, I like this, we'll be tied. Um, shame, it's too bad for someone who has no one to bring him up. Right? So, don't isolate yourself. Don't separate yourself from the community. Because the community can really help you when you can't get out of, you know, either you physically fall in and you have someone with you, they can bring you up. Or if you're down, if you're stuck in the quagmire of, you know, feeling really alone, when you have someone to metaphorically pick you up, that's so, there's nothing at that moment more valuable than someone who can pull you out of the quagmire of that cloud that's you're not in a quagmire of clouds. I'm mixing metaphors there, but that's okay because hopefully you all are <laughs> coming with me. Um, and I think it's a beautiful way of thinking about the importance of the individual not to bring themselves out from the community. I think about that a lot with um, tefillah as well. You know, it's really easy to get ca caught up in, you know, well, I daven better when I am not a minion, right? And for me, in many ways, that's true. My tefillah, like oftentimes the Baal tefillah will go much faster than I am. So for me to keep up with the Baal tefillah, I'm zooming through my tefillah or I'm saying less than I would want to say necessarily. And there are a lot of tefillah where really you should be saying them with the tzibor. So then I've lost a lot of different things. You know, I don't have a kavana that I need to have or that new I want to have if I'm davening in the minion. At the same time, why is it so important to daven in a minion? Because let's say one day I am not able to have the focus that I need, right? Or I'm not able to have the kind of, you know, um, strength that I need. Well, at the end of the day, if I'm not focused, the community is helping me in creating that collective focus and the kind of like energy, as it were, that collective kavana creates is so tremendous that, you know, this is one of those cases where it's not like the kavana is gone without my little kavana. It's that if I'm struggling with mine, the community will help me. It'll keep me part of the unit of collective kavana. It's amazing. My dad, Lava Shalom, did a lot of research on um, the way in which kavana can impact other things. You know, there's research that, um, that was done what, by, I can't remember who it was, when there were a lot of Buddhist monks, again, or I can't remember what kind of monks they were, where when they were meditating, in their meditations, they were thinking about the, sa um, the same thing, like maybe a random that there was a random number generator and they were focused on, you know, making a change, impacting this random number generator. And they did because of that collective kavana. Does that happen all the time? It does not happen all the time, right? It's not like all of a sudden, if we have an entire congregation focusing their tefillot on something 
then automatically something happens. We all know that unfortunately that's not true necessarily, but there is power to collective tefillah. And so, but what if I can't get there? I am in a bad space or I have a lot going on at work and I just can't focus myself. I can't be mindful. I can't be in the moment. It's just not helping me. I have another or I have others to carry me. Two are better than one. You know, I can't build a beautiful building. I can't accomplish a great project if it's just me. I can't, you know, make, I can't have the power of Beethoven's symphony if it's only me. If that's my goal, not to do a, not to play a sonata, but to play a symphony, I need someone else, even just a duet. Having one more person can help me up if I fall. Or if we both fall, one of us is going to get up sooner. And what it doesn't say right here. It doesn't say if one person fell, the other will bring them up, um, that, you know, they're both down. It doesn't specify, right? This is, should they fall? One can raise the other. Someone's going to get up first, or maybe the collective strength, if they put all four of their hands down together and push, you know, or if they need, if they're stuck and they need to push it, whatever it is, no matter what, two's going to be better than one. This doesn't negate the individual. And the value of the individual, it only says that when you have more than one, it saves you from, you know, what you might not be able to accomplish on your own. So that's why you have Hill's teaching of don't separate yourself for the community. It doesn't just hurt the community, but also hurts you. Not in a bad way, but in a, you know, this could really be to your benefit way. So again, I'll pause. Okay. Um, 9, 12. I have till 9.30, right? Do I have till 9.30? Alana? I can't remember. I do, right? Anybody can jump in and say and confirm for me. Yes, you have to 9.30. Keep going. All right. Um, but I'm going to zoom ahead because there are some beautiful Rabbi Sachs, Alava Shalom, Zichron Olav Racha passages that I want to look at. And so what I'm actually going to do is I will... I'm actually going to, I'll skip ahead to the Aravut um, sources and I'll summarize them and get to Rabbi Sachs because um, in his memory and in his honor and the tremendous legacy that he left all of us, I want to make sure that we get to him as well and his beautiful things to say about community. And so this next section that I have here um, on Aravut is not just about the value of community and the value of the individual and the importance of each individual of having the community and each community having an individual, right? This Suresh of Yehud Alevi talks about that when you have a body, right? Someone who takes themselves away, the Yehud Alevi is, um, I don't know where I put him. Um, oh, he's down here. Is that, you know, you, he, the, a functioning body needs each limb. And when you take away the limb, it harms the community. So a person can't take themselves out because of harm, right? It's not Rivera Levy talks about the way that someone moving themselves from a community harms everybody as opposed to just harming themselves. Um, but Arivut adds a piece that it sort of translates Arivut as mutual collective, mutual collective responsibility, that each person in the community doesn't just belong, but it's our responsibility to look out for or to ensure the, that everybody other in the community were responsible for them and for their behavior. So if one person does something negative, then we're responsible for that behavior because we weren't you know, taking responsibility to ensure that they were being their best self, right? Or it doesn't necessarily have to be negative. It could just be neutral, but people depend on us. It's not, when you're in a community, the community suffers because everybody takes responsibility for each other and doing a lot of reading um, on community outside of education. And that part of being, um, what a community requires in order, like even within the definition of community is that every member looks out for the other person. That You can't have a unit of people that could be, could get the, um, the identification as a community, unless there's Aravut, unless I use that term, right? Unless you have the group of people committing to look out for one another, 
and to ensure that each person feels that sense of belonging to the group. That's what makes a, a community a community. And so Arivut, that concept of mutual responsibility, really just ensures community and reinforces community. But by saying, that's the famous pasuk, it's every, is every, every Jew's responsible for the other person. If one person is not doing what they need to be doing, well, it was your responsibility to look out for them, right? Again, in my teaching, this comes up, um, and this is a conversation among educators of collective consequence, right? If you have one student who, or two students that are misbehaving, can you say to the class, you know what, if you guys can't all get it together, or you two people, if you can't stop talking because you keep talking and keep disrupting, then everybody's going to stay behind, you know, and not take their break. Is that fair? That's a conversation among educators. If you can say collective consequence or not, is it fair to, you know, sort of make the whole class stay back because only two or three people were, two or three students were, you know, disrupting class. But what it acknowledges, even within the conversation, even if you are with you're for it or against it, or you're for it in some circumstances, or you're not for it in other circumstances, the fact that it's a question acknowledges the importance of and the um, obligation of a community having arvut. And the Jewish sources reflect that. Um, so that's what these are saying. Um, I want to look at what Rabbi Sachs has to say, but to come back to um, Migdal Lavel, what was happening, one particular, um, and again, this is Ramota Hatton, who is an educator in Israel. The way that he understands Migdal Lavel is that there was, the unity was really uniformity. And what having that unity did was it ultimately, like maybe at that moment in building the city and building the tower at that moment was everybody was doing their part as individuals, at the end of the day, the reality of the world is that everybody is an individual. And when you're working on a project, you don't allow for the individuals to be their selves, then that is, that needs to be prevented. Then you mar that marginalization happens, prejudice happens, extremism happens. So, you know, the problem, like God is coming down and saying, look at what happens when they all speak one language and they all have one vision. They, this is what happens. And so in order for me to prevent, like right now it might not be happening, but it could happen. Who knows what they'll be able to do. They're building a city. Amazing. They're building a tower. Amazing. But what about when they decide to do something else? What's going to happen? There's a very real possibility that there's going to be the, you know, the people that are in the minority are going to be marginalized. And so God ensures that there's always going to be diversity because part of so interesting, um, the greater good, which is um, out of um, a group of psychologists and um, sociologists outside that comes um, as part of University of Berkeley, they've sort of identified what they call the keys to well-being of an individual in a community, the top 10. And among the top 10 are connectedness, empathy, and diversity. And so it acknowledges both that, you know, again, if we're going to see those as the keys to well-being of a community, you need to acknowledge the individual, that each group has these individuals, that's diversity. You need empathy because you need to appreciate the value of the other. And you need the connection to those other people. But you also need, right, there's collect, there's happiness is there, it's, uh, it's mindfulness is there. There's a lot about individuality there. Because when you squash what the person has to bring to the table and you don't value each individual, then that doesn't work. But within the Jewish sources, they may not need me then the individual, yes, that's important. The community, I'm part of it. Yes, that's important. Right? The sources are clear. It's not just like everybody melts together, community. It's people are coming together and being their selves, being their best selves in the community, giving and responsible for others to be their best selves, and they can't even be their own best selves unless they're with others. So that is, it's coming back, it's why I wanted to start and stop with Migdal Bavel, is to really highlight that while it seems like Migdal Bavel is a narrative that celebrates community and unity, it really 
is a narrative about the um, the challenge of when you negate negate the individual within the community. Okay, but I want to look at because we have a little bit of time. We can always come back to to that. So I just changed screens. Can everybody see the Jonathan Sachs, the Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the Chronol of Racha screen? Need to know that it's no. there. Yeah. It no, it's still, it's still, okay. uh, I think you have to come, yeah, you sometimes wanna, have to come out of, yeah, I'm going to stop my share. The, yeah, and, and switch pages and then go back in. Let's do that. Okay. Awesome. Share my screen. Okay. This one. okay. Um, and I did share this with, um, for those who have them in paper version in front of them, I shared this one as well. Um, and I guess, he has so many things to say about it's amazing. I was like um, spoiled for choice in looking for the, the, the different things that he has to say about community. Um, and I'll start with the smallest one. So this is taken from Celebrating Life, Finding Happiness in Unexpected Places. And he says, similar to that 10 keys of well being, communities are a central part of collective well being. They bridge the gap between family and society. They are, they are large enough to extend our sympathies but small enough to be intelligible. They are the human face of the common good, which would otherwise remain an abstraction. They, excuse me, they are where we learn to be citizens carrying our share of collective weight. Freedom is the art of association and it's in communities that we learn it. So again, this is about the value of the community, but what a small community brings to the global community, right? It's what, you know, being like on a micro community brings to the world. And that we learn how to be our, again, our best self, right? How we learn how to be citizens. We learn our voot. We learn what mutual responsibility is by being with others. That seems obvious, but it's not obvious. It would, like, it's not obvious that this is a trait. Our voot is a trait that we must have. We're social creatures. We're social animals, right? Throughout our ages, throughout, like, since the beginning of time, we were social. Right, we were created into Parak Aleph of Breshit, Adam and Chava, or male and female are created at the same time, as it were, you know, in the grand scheme of time. In Parak Bet, it's Adam first, but in Parak Aleph, when we first meet the creation of humanity, Zachar and Akiva are together. We're created to be more than one. And here, Rabbi Sachs is saying, right, they, communities, are the human face of the common good together. So that is in that passage. And um, by the way, I did know, and I, oh, I should have started with this. I did know we weren't getting to every, every source because I, I don't think I've taught one class, one sheer where I have gone through all my sources. I can't think of one time I've managed. And I know that as a reality and truth about myself, but I include the sources in case you yourself would like to look at them and explore them further. And that if you don't like, I have these books, but if you don't have them, now you have these sources. And I think that they're very special, whether it's what Rabbi Sachs is saying um, or these sources on the source sheet. And in a letter in the scroll, I actually, it's long, I know, but I really, it's so well articulated that this one, I really want to read inside. The one from Morality. So this is a one of his most recent books that I think just came out this year or last year, Restoring the Common Good in Divided Times. It's not, um, it's meant to be for everyone. Um, and he talks about what a covenant is versus a contract and that um, Jews in our, like from our very inception as Israelites, as a nation, our relationship with God was covenantal. It was always about responsibility one to the other. And that at the end of the day, everything that we do is that not necessarily that we as humans do and in our ideal self is covenantal, where each person looks out for the other or each community looks out for each community, right? And that's what creates, a covenant creates a moral community. Morality emerges from the coming together of peoples, but those that are taking responsibility. The arevut is really the key of covenant. Um, 
right? What matters is a covenant is what matters is a covenant and that what matters, this should say in a covenant is not how big or small the group thereby um, included, but the commitment to each other, right? And so that's how community works where each individual community involves everyone and it's just only as strong as everyone that's in it. But it's this one that I really want. We're not gonna have time to look at, I'm looking at my clock and it says 925. Um, but we'll do as much as we can on this one and then we'll pull it together. He says in a letter in the scroll, we can see life as a succession of moments spent like coins in return for pleasures of various kinds. Or we can see our life as though it were a letter of the alphabet. A letter on its own has no meaning, yet when letters are joined to others, they make a word. Words combine with others to make a sentence. Sentences connect to make a paragraph and paragraphs join to make a story. That is how the Baal Shem Tov understood life. Every Jew is a letter. Every, each Jewish family is a word, every community is a sentence, and the Jewish people at any one time are a paragraph. The Jewish people through time constitute a story, the strangest and most moving story in the annals of mankind. Um, the, at the heart of a covenant, the idea of emunah, right, so what he says before, which means faithfulness or loyalty, right, he doesn't talk about it as being belief, but faithfulness and loyalty. Jews felt a loyalty to generations past and generations yet unborn to continue the narrative. A Torah scroll that is missing a letter is rendered invalid or defective. Um, and I'm going to write, unlike almost every other vision of the ideal society, Jews knew that theirs was the work of many generations that, and that therefore they must be part of that journey, letters in the scroll. To be a Jew now in the days of Moses is to hear the call of those who came before us and know that we are the guardians of their story. Um, I'm a Jew because knowing the story of my people, I hear their call to write the next chapter. I did not come from nowhere. I have a past. And if any past commands anyone, this past commands me. I'm a Jew because only if I remain a Jew will the story of a hundred generations live on in me. I continue their journey because having come this far, I may not let it, let it and them fail. I cannot be missing the letter in the scroll. I love this. I love this because at the end of the day, it is really putting, it's acknowledging the importance of the individual. It's not that a letter has no value, but the true, the full meaning of the letter really shines when it's part of the word. Then, and then the word really shines when it's part of the sentence. And the sentence really shines when it's part of a paragraph, right? And so we need to see ourselves as individuals as part of that, and that if you take out one letter, right, this, that's the idea of the Torah scroll. It's an invalid Torah scroll, right? The Torah scroll tells a story, right? From there is a beginning and end in a Torah scroll, but you take one out, one individual letter, that's like that puzzle, right? Then it's an invalid Torah. And here, what he talks about with community is not just community in the present, but it's community of the past and the future. Because what's, we've got, letter, word, sentence, paragraph, and then we've got history. And that being part of a community for us is being a part of a chain that connects us to the community in the past and the community in the, in the future. And my responsibility is to carry on that story, right? Paragraph then leads to story. And the story is the story of history, of our history, or really what he's saying, of my history. And I can't be the one with my letter, that I'm the letter that doesn't continue on, doesn't let that story continue. And it's just an incredibly beautiful way of seeing the value of each individual as you can't have the story without that one bit of the story. And yet I'm only a letter when I'm not part of a story. And there's a lot of, um, it's a lot, there are a lot of, you know, um, a lot of research and books that talk about the importance of knowing our narrative and being able to articulate the narrative of our lives. There's even something called narrative therapy within like, the realm of psychology and psychotherapy. Um, but the importance of knowing a story. And here he's really saying that, that we as each individual make up a story, but the story is incomplete without each of us. So pulling all these pieces together, and again, it's almost reinforcing what we've been saying, is that individ the individual, and I would, and individuality, so even in the individual, it just, you know, that's the black and white puzzle piece. But individuality, where a person acknowledges who they are and what they offer, right? 
at the Simcha, at the, at the Simcha Beit HaShoeva, if I'm not there, no one's there, right? Because I have what to add that no one else can add. Imena Nili Mili comes first. If I am not looking out for myself, who's going to look out for me as an individual? How can I, how can I love someone else to the best of, to maximize the love of someone else if I don't love myself, right? The entire world, I need to say, was created for me because I'm created in the image of God and no one else is like me. At the same time, my best self really comes when I see myself as part of the scroll, as part of an ongoing history, as part of a community. The community is not what it needs to be without me, and I'm not what I need to be without the community, right? It's interlaced. It's not their balance and equal, and it's not that it's swallowed. It's that they're interlaced together, and they can never be separated within the context of um, us and us as individuals and us as a community being the best, our best selves, as it were. So, sorry, it's 931. Are there any questions or comments on these pieces? Okay, so I wish you all um, good health, please God, for you and your families. And I wish you joy and many moments of meaning. Um, and I really thank you for um, giving me the opportunity. And Alana, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my Torah again thank with you. Thank you so much, Karen. It was so good to have you back. It was such a great class. Thank you. I'll put that there.